Now that we proved the four axioms that singular homology satisfies, the four einberg steenbrad axioms, we now want to discuss an additional axiom that actually satisfies, and that's the so-called additivity axiom. And the statement is simply that if you have a general topological space, then its decomposition into its path components is respected by singular homology. Yeah? And to make this precise, let me formulate it in writing. So let X be a topological space. Then we, be, then we denote by pi zero of X just the set of the path components of the space. Okay, and this terminology, of course, is no coincidence. Yeah, if you think about it, well, pi one was the fundamental group, yeah, which is sort of embeddings of circles up to filling them up with disks. So this is um, embedding as zeros, so two points in the space up to connecting them by a path. So this is sort of why um, this exactly corresponds to the path components of the space. And then we have the following um, theorem. The nth singular homology of our space X actually decomposes as the direct sum over all path components, call them X alpha. And now we take the homology of just that particular path component. So we should um, comment at this point that in case the topological space, space has only finitely many path components, then this, this is already a consequence of the first four um, einberg steenrod axioms. And I think we discussed this in a previous video. Right? Yeah, I showed it for a topological sum of two spaces. Exactly. So Yeah, and space, in this case, the space is the topological, topological sum. sum of the path components. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then you do it inductively for finitely many path components. Right. So the difference here is that I didn't require any more condition on this set of path components and maybe of any cardinality. Finite, countable, even uncountable, it doesn't matter. Yeah? So this is why this needs now additional proof because it relies on one simple observation. The standard N simplex is actually a path, com path connected space. And we showed in the first part of this course that images of path connected spaces under continuous maps are still path, con path connected. So let me write this down for every sigma n in the singular chain complex of x. We have that actually the image of the singular simplex, so just sigma n of delta n is path connected. And therefore, actually, it must be contained in any one of these um, path components of the space. Yeah? It cannot touch two different ones. It must be lie entirely in, in one of them. And um, this um, has the consequence that actually already on the chain complex level, we have such a decomposition. Decompos so thus, Cn sing of x, actually the chain complex itself, is the direct sum over all path components of, of X, Cn sing X alpha, right? Because any singular simplex we've got here must have image contained in one of the X alpha, so it appears on the right-hand side. Yeah? So this is actually the same collection of, um, of singular simplices which um, generate these um, modules on both sides of the of the equation. Yeah, I would say that the basis on the left is somehow partitioned into subsets according to the yes. path components, right? That's even better, yeah. So, yeah. The basis can be written as a disjoint union of singular simplices um, mm -hmm. according to those path components and then, yes, this is just 
um, yeah, generating each of these um, disjoint sets in this decomposition. So, right. And the second observation is if I take the boundary of such a sing singular simplex, then um, what happens? Well, the boundary of such a singular, singular simplex here, um, that was a chain of um, the faces of this singular simplex with um, the appropriate sign. But of course, if the whole simplex is mapped to one path component, then also the faces are mapped to this, to this very path component, which has the effect that actually the differential in this singular chain complex of X does respect this decomposition written here on the right hand side. Yeah? So therefore we've got that if we take the differential of one of these submodules here, C and sing X alpha, then the image lies in the very same um, path component, but of course now we got to take one degree lower, so it's C and minus one sing of X alpha. So in other words, what this means is that this direct sum decomposition for the n singular chain module, which we've got here, that's actually not only a direct sum composition for each level, but actually what we showed here is that we have a direct sum decomposition of the whole chain complex. Yeah? So actually C, C star sing X is the direct sum, the co-product in the category of R chain complexes of the chain complexes of um, all the path components here. So the differentials actually in this direct sum decomposition are just diagonal block matrices and therefore the homology also is just the direct sum over all path components. Yeah? Therefore, the homology of the singular chain complex of X, this is really the same as the direct sum whoops, overall path components of the homology <coughs> of this chain complex of this path component, X alpha. And this is just what we want, yeah? So this is just the direct sum X alpha of pi naught X alpha and pi naught X of H M sing. Let's write sing here also. X alpha. Okay. So as you can see, we did use here something that we do not have in a general um, homology theory. We use something which is um, particular, which is peculiar to this, um, <coughs> excuse me, to this um, singular homology, we use this um, connectedness of the of um, the image of the, the n of the n of the singular n simplices. So there's really an argument about uh, singular homology here, which does not apply to general homology theories. Okay, this was almost um, the statement of the additivity axiom that I promised we would prove for singular homology. But nevertheless, let us um, state this axiom or that homology singular homology satisfies this axiom in writing so that we have a record of it. So the corollary is now that singular homology satisfies the additivity axiom So since this is supposed to be an axiom, this, this means it should be formulated entirely in the data that is available from the einberg steenrod axioms. So let's do this. The additivity axiom, that is the inclusions of the factors into a coproduct. So meaning the inclusions xi goes into such a topological sum with arbitrary index set xi. These inclusions induce an isomorphism. An 
an isomorphism from the nth singular homology of this coproduct. Well, call it x, of course. Oh, let's move this aside. To the direct sum now here of these modules i in i, h n sing x i. Okay, yeah, so whatever follows after the that is here, this is precisely the formulation of the additivity axiom. And again, the point here being that this index set i is allowed to be of arbitrary cardinality. Yeah? If it was just finite, then we wouldn't have to formulate this as a separate axiom. It would follow from the first, one, first four ones. But in this case, when we allow arbitrary index, index sets here, then we do need this. I mean, this is an additional assertion in, in, in this case. And well, so actually these um, inclusions into the coproduct here, they induce um, an I mean, the universal map coming out of the universal property of, of the coproduct actually means that the map goes in this direction from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And the statement that this is an isomorphism, well, it's a corollary of the previous theorem in the, in the sense that it's, it's got the same proof, yeah? So again, the image of um, the standard n-simplex by a singular n-simplex is a connected um, space, and therefore it must be contained in, a, in, a, um, in some path component of the space. But these xi's, yeah, by, by the definition of the coproduct topology, these are just unions of full path components, yeah? So each singular sim simplex, therefore, must end up in one of those um, subspaces xi. Yeah? So this is precisely the same proof. OK, so singular homology satisfies the additivity axiom. And to end this video, I now want to make um, some additional remarks. Namely, as we constructed singular homology, um, we came up with abelian groups in the end, yeah? just z modules. But one can do the construction a little more general than this. Yeah? So this is the first remark. So we formulated um, singular homology by using the ring Z, but actually this was not necessary. We, should, we could have taken any other commutative ring R. So the remark is about singular homology with coefficients. coefficients. And the first part is in the construction. Of singular homology. Where we use no property. of the ring of integers beside commutativity. Let's make sure that everybody can read this. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we were working with non-commutative rings, then we would have to pay close attention tension whether we are dealing with left or right modules and so, so forth. This, of course, we did not do, so we used commutativity, but that was actually the only algebraic property we really used about this um, ring R. And therefore, just the same construction works for any commutative ring. Yeah? So we can define singular homology of a space X relative to a subspace A with coefficients in any commutative ring R for any commutative ring R. Yeah, so beforehand we considered the free abelian group generated by all singular n simplices, so the free Z module generated by singular n sim simplices. Of course, we could as well have taken the free R module generated by singular n simplices and the construction would have gone through as before. Yeah, this would be would have been no problems. It was just for simplicity that we assumed this. But a little more general still than that, that's the second part of the remark, we can consider homology with coefficients not only in a ring, but in a module over that ring. So more generally,
say M is some R module, where R again is a commutative ring, then we can define what homology with coefficients in this module is, and we do this as follows. namely as the nth homology of the following chain complex, which we slightly modify, so as the nth homology of the chain complex which is given by the singular chain complex of x comma a with coefficients in R now, as I just told you, yeah, just con consisting of the free R modules generated by singular n simplices. And now what we do is we just take the tensor product of this R module with our fixed module m. Yeah. And we also obtain a new differential on this um, tensor product which is just given by, well, you take the old differential in the left component, so d sing star, and we form the tensor product just with the identity on m. Yeah? So this tensor product, you can just think of it level-wise. Yeah? So in each degree, we get this R module, which is just the tensor product over R with m, and then we get a new differential just um, as the old one tends on the identity on the coefficient module m. And this actually does become a, a differential again, because if you form the composition of two consecutive differentials here, then you will get zero in, on the left-hand side of such, of such a tensor here, but that means that the whole tensor is zero. Yeah? If you want, you can pull out a zero from the left-hand side and pull it over to the right-hand side, and then it's, it's zero altogether. So this still um, is a chain complex in the um, original sense of the word, and therefore we can form its homology, and this is what, by definition, is um, singular homology with coefficients in this coefficient module m. And finally, the question is now, of course, does this new, newly defined singular homology with coefficients satisfy, again, the eigenberg steenrod axioms? And the answer is yes. So that's the final remark here. Since this tensor product is a functor, so since tensor rm, um, is a functor that has the property that it takes chain homotopies of chain complexes to chain homotopies. The same proofs that we did before um, for proving the four einberg steenrod axioms work again in this setting. There's one caveat that I have to mention here, namely we did not quite construct um, a chain homotopy inverse of the inclusion of u small chains for the excision proof. Yeah? But we mentioned at that point that it is possible to construct such a chain homotopy inverse so that actually inclusion of u small chains is chain homotopic, um, does have a chain homotopy inverse. Yeah? And just taking the tensor products of those chain homotopies, you get chain homotopies again, and therefore then you also obtain the proof of excision. Yeah? So this is a slight cheat, admittedly. Yeah? We did not prove it that way, but it can be done. So. Since this functor takes chain homotopies chain homotopies to chain homotopies, this defines a homology theory, and even, um, I mean, in the sense of einberg steenrod and actually even, again, an, a, a, an ordinary homology theory, yeah? meaning that the dimension axiom is also satisfied. The only difference being now that the zeros homology of a um, one-point space is now not going to be R, it's just going to be this coefficient module n. There is another spot where you have to be slightly careful, but it works just fine. This is when you prove the 
long exact sequence out of the short exact sequence of a subspace because tensoring with n is not exact. Ah, but right. this sequence is in each degree a split sequence, so in that case tensoring with m is exact and everything really goes through as for C coefficients. Yes. Because this quotient module def defining relative mm -hmm. singular homolog homology, it so turns on out is again a free module, right? Because you really take out some part of the basis if you want. Right. So, yes. Right. So they are split, so therefore it's still exact. So, okay. So maybe this was a little more than a little cheat, but um, it's true and it works. One just has to be careful at the appropriate steps.